Yeah, I think it's working. Okay, uh, you guys can all see that okay, right? Impurity phase shift and WKB? Great. Okay, so uh, let's get this show on the road. Um, so the plan for today is to um, sort of finish off our scattering discussion with, by saying a little bit more about the phase shift. And I wanna give an example of a, of a phase shift um, uh, like a real live one, you know, that, that we measured before. So you can see what I'm talking about. Maybe that will help. Um, and then we'll talk about the new, and then the new topic is, a, a, oh, oh, mute. Somebody's not muting, mute yourself. Um, okay. So let's just re remind ourselves a little bit what we're talking about. Um, and <clears throat> the, uh, thing that, motivated all of this is a discussion of partial waves scattering using partial waves and we went through all the fancy math and stuff and, and the, the big result was this that if i have some scatterer some spherically symmetric scatterer then the the cross section the total cross section of that scatterer the scattering cross section can be written using this very beautiful simple compact little formula four pi over k squared, I have to sum over all angular momentum. Um, and uh, the sum is 2L plus one times sine squared of the scattering phase shift. And so that's a beautiful little formula, so simple, but of course the price you pay for the simplicity is that you have to introduce this weird quantity, phase shift, the scattering phase shift. And what the heck is that? And we've discussed it in great detail um, and we know that if we have a uh, free particle, then the radial wave function of, of the in spherical, in spherical uh, coordinates, the radial wave function for a free particle with energy E and angle momentum L is equal to um, some normalization constant times the spherical Bessel function. And that's, that's the solution of the Schrodinger equation that you all did last semester. But then we know that if we have a, a, a potential, if we turn on some scattering potential, then we know that the radial wave function changes. And it goes from being just a regular Bessel function to a uh, phase shifted Bessel function. for large r, far away from the potential. So we know that that's the case, um, usually. <laughs> and so then the question is, so all we got to do then is solve the Schrodinger equation with the potential and, and find the phase shift by plugging, by, by uh, seeing how it is different from just a regular spherical Bessel function. And so, the trick, a nice trick, a nice thing to notice is the fact that usually, uh, that typically we only have to worry about um, the small uh, angular momenta. So typically in the sum, when we have L equals zero to infinity, Usually it's just L equals zero to, <laughs> you know, zero or one or two. It usually, usually only, only small ones usually count. And that's what makes it so useful. And I sort of discussed this before, and I will just sort of remind you why we only have to worry about the small angular momenta and that's because if we can 
this is, I sort of did this last time. I'm not gonna do all of what I did last time. I'll do it a little differently. But here, if we have a potential, and if this is R, the radial component, and if this is our potential, say some scattering potential, suppose this is our scatterer, you know, that's some V naught uh, out to some R naught, then um, we see that we have these, these um, the, what we see is that the, the potential, the, the effective potential that the particle sees is of course the, the applied potential V of R, where this is you know, the applied potential V of R, the scattering potential, but, there's, but the trick in the whole, the, the, the key concept is that there's this extra part, the centripetal uh, potential, the centripetal component that you get because you're in spherical coordinates. And so that's the centripetal or centrifugal or whatever you want to call it component that you've all seen before. And it's really important. And because if I plot this guy, then this is the guy that pushes you away from the origin, pushes you away from the origin. And so you can see it. Like if I plot it, it looks like this. There's all these different families of curves, because this will be the one for L equals one, L equals two, L equals three, because you see you have an L there. And so a particle with different angular momentum sees a different centripetal potential. And that makes sense, because it's like when you're swinging a rock on a string, if you swing the rock faster, then it pulls away harder. Whereas if you swing it slower, then it pulls away less, less hard. So it makes sense that the potential should depend on how fast the rock is swinging. Uh, and so these are the, so this is the centripetal component, which is a function of L and R. Um, and so that means then that if I come in um, with, uh, the point is that if I come in, suppose if I come in with some energy like this, this, if this is my energy, here, the dashed line, then, and suppose I have, suppose my angle momentum, as an example, suppose my particle has angle momentum L equals two. Then, then what's gonna happen is the particle out here, the wave function will look wiggly, 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 but then as soon as it hits this point right here, it's gonna to start to decay. And notice that it might decay to zero even before it hits that potential, in which case it doesn't even, the particle doesn't even see the potential. And so the scattering phase shift then would be zero. So the, the question, so this is the key thing right there. And that is the point where E equals the centripetal uh, potential. And so that's the key point. And so the question then is, um, where is this location? I'll call this the, um, just I'll call this the closest approach. Even though the wave function decays a little bit inside, just for simplicity, let's call the closest approach is when the energy of the particle equals the centripetal potential. That's how close the, the particle can get in. Even a free particle, forget about, you know, even forgetting about the potential, any free, any particle with L, that's the closest you can get in. And so, and so let's calculate this R closest. How do we find the R closest, the closest approach? Then what we do is we just can set uh, the energy of the particle equal to the centripetal potential which is easy, just h bar squared L times L plus one over two M R squared. <clears throat> and, and just for simplicity of math, we can just call this h bar squared L squared over two M R squared. And so then what we notice from this, if that's equal to the energy for this closest approach, then we can see then that uh, L squared is equal to uh, two M E times r squared over h bar squared, and that's just equal to um, this guy times r squared. And so what is, what is that? 
What is this guy? Can someone tell me? K squared. Yeah, exactly. So we see that L squared equals K squared R squared. And so then that just tells us that the, uh, the closest approach is approximately equal to uh, L over K, right? That's basically how close the particle gets. It depends on the angle of momentum and K, the energy. Uh, if, if in K, that makes sense because if the energy is really high, it gets closer. That means I have a bigger K. Um, and so, and so, to, and so, the most so to find the most to find the highest um, relevant uh, phase shift. Then what we do is we say what we do is we set our closest to equal the range of the potential. So here's my potential right here. That's the range of the potential. And so for the wave function to see the potential, then the closest approach has to be as close as the potential to see it. So we just set them equal. And so then what we have is our naught is equal to L max over K. And so then we see that the most, that the, that the highest relevant angular momentum for phase shifts is when L max is equal to uh, K R naught. And so what that tells us is that um, if um, the energy is low, meaning that if K R naught is less than one, lot, way less than one, then that means that L max is much less than one. And so that means that the only important angular momentum that we have to worry about is L equals what? Zero. Zero. Right. In which case our cross set our our beautiful little formula for the cross section, where is it? It's way up here. Where did I put it? Oh yeah, I'll put a circle around it. See, this, this is a sum over all angular momentum, L equals zero to infinity, but now the sum only goes to L equals zero. And so it just becomes really simple because now we see that then the, for this low energy case, then the total cross section is just gonna be um, four pi over K squared times uh, sine squared del uh, the zero. Let's see, did I get that right? Yeah, sine squared, of, yeah. And so that's just a cute little thing to notice. And so what we call this is, and so if this is true, then we call this S wave scattering. Okay, and that, and that happens a lot in nature because often you have low energy things hitting, in which case, so it's really this, so then you only have to worry about the L equals zero phase shift. So that's nice. Um, Professor Kirby, can I ask a question? Of course. What does the S stand for in S wave scattering? Ah, very good. Uh, it's this thing. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I have L equals zero, one, two, three. Like these are all the possible values of L, right? And so when you did the hydrogen atom last semester, you remember that there's uh, some crazy, ridiculous naming convention that is because of some bizarre things that happened 150 years ago that no one can barely remember. And for some weird historical reason, you call L equals zero um, S, L equals one, we call what? Somebody tell me. Oh, P. And L equals two is, what do we, what is it called? D. Exactly. And this guy, Keep going. <laughs> F. Yeah, and that's all I remember. <laughs> okay, I don't think I've ever seen it go higher than F. So uh, S P D F, and those are free because like the old guys, you know, they did some spectroscopy and they saw the line was sharp. So they said, oh, they didn't know quantum mechanics. They said, oh, the spectroscopic line is sharp. We'll call it the F. And P was for, I don't know what that stood for. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, okay, so these are just weird historical things, and so. For example, if 
um, if if the uh, if we had to worry about uh, L equals one component of the scattering, then instead of calling it S wave scattering, what would we call it? Somebody tell me. If if we actually had to worry about the you know, the L equals one phase shift, for example, if that was suddenly really important because of some weird nuance of the potential and the energy, then what kind of scattering would that be? P wave? Yeah. Then we call it P wave. We call it P wave scattering. Okay. So I think you see the pattern there. Uh, and so now let's give an example. And so there are many possible examples. I mean, you guys, you know, in your homework are some examples, but I want to give you a special example. That's, I, I'm a condensed matter person. And so um, I'm going to give you an example from condensed matter. And I'm not saying that condensed matter is better than anything else, but it's just what I happen to know more. That's my specialty. So let's give an example from condensed matter. And so let's talk about scattering. Let's give a special, a special example. Let's talk about impurity scattering. So let's talk about an impurity that's sitting in a crystal, impurity scattering. Okay, so, so now let's talk about like, so this is like an example from my own research, because I want you just to sort of see how all these concepts can be used in, one, in, a, in a particular way that maybe you haven't thought of before. Um, okay, so let's, this is the question that I want to ask. So, um, this is the question I want to ask. Suppose you take a two-dimensional material, okay, flatland, two dimensions, and suppose you drop a single impurity in that material, okay? So the material is just a perfect two-dimensional uh, crystal, just a two-dimensional world, and it's full of electrons. Lots of, let's say that there's lots of electrons and I put an atom and I drop an atom into the middle of it, uh, a two dimensional pool of electrons. I drop an atom in the middle. And so um, what, does it, what does it look like? Then if, then if you did that, the question is what do the electrons do? What do they look like? Okay, that's the question. What are they doing? And what do they look like? Uh, because what's happening is you can imagine that I have lots of electrons and the electrons are like little waves. And the, you can imagine the electrons are hitting the atom and they're bouncing off of the atom in some weird way, right? So the electrons are going boing, boing, they're zipping all around. There's one, there's another one, and there's another one. They're all over the place and they're just like little waves, little quantum waves running around and every now and then they bounce off of that atom. And so what do they look like? That's the question. Um, and so um, it's, not, it's, not an obvious, it's not obvious how to answer that because you know, how do you see an electron? Like what does it mean to even see? So what does it mean to see? Okay, like this, this you know, because like if, if I wanna look at those electrons and see, and see what they do, how do I see? So normally when we see something, we, we see it with light. Normally we use light. Can we use light here? Folks, someone tell me. Can we use light? Nope. What? No. Why not? Because the electrons are too small. Yeah, exactly, and, and the atom is too small. Right, because the, the wavelength of light is like around half a micron, right? 5,000 angstroms, typically, you know, unless we're talking about, um, what, you know, x-rays or something. But, uh, but they're too high energy anyway, so they won't work. But the, but the typical wavelength of optical light is 5,000 angstroms, and the atom, the size of the atom is one angstrom. So light is way too big. It's no good. So... Um, what we use um, is something else. We use a, a scanning tunneling microscope, STM. Scanning tunneling microscope. 
and that's a that's a technique that I use a lot. That's my specialty. Uh, and so uh, the the idea of the scanning tunneling microscope is that if I have some object, some surface, I'll call this a surface. Then we take a, a sharp metal needle. We'll call that the tip. And I and you put a voltage on it with respect to the surface and you measure the current. And that's a battery V. And then what happens is you um, you can you can suck electrons out. And that's current. Because the electrons, you, you suck out the electrons. Tip sucks out electrons. And that creates current, right? Because I is just equal to number of electrons per second. That's what current is. So it's just how many electrons you suck out. Okay, and so, uh, and when you're sucking them out, uh, it's the, the electrons are tunneling. They're, it's quantum mechanical tunneling. Electrons are tunneling out. And I'm not going to get into all those details because they don't really matter for this discussion. Uh, like how does the tunneling work and blah, blah, blah. We don't need to get into all that. Um, but the important thing is just to know that the little tip can suck out the electrons. And the beauty of it is that is that the tip is small. Because when you have a tip, the tip is made out of atoms, right? These are This is the tip. I'm drawing the atoms of the tip. And if you go to the very tippy tip of the tip, there's always going to be one last atom. And that's the atom we use. And the funny thing is that people don't realize is that, you know, somebody might say, oh, my God, isn't it hard to make a tip? You know, you got to get one last atom. But the funny thing is that any piece of metal always has one last atom. So I could use a fork. I could use a spoon. I could use a dull spoon from your kitchen because even your spoon, if I bring it closer and closer to the surface, there's going to be one last atom that touches the surface first, and that's the atom we use. So making a tip is completely trivial. We usually just use wire clippers, clip, make a tip, or we can play other games. We can etch them and make them sharp. But the point is, is that it's very simple to make a sharp tip. It's easier than you might expect. There's always one last atom, and that's the one we use. Uh, okay, and so then the and so then what we do is we measure the current with the current meter there that little thing and then uh, <clears throat> And so the question then is What do you see? You know, what does the STM see? And and the thing is is that th this is the important point is that th it turns out that um, if you do some math and thinking in quantum mechanics and, and use actually Fermi's golden rule, if you work out Fermi's golden rule for this uh, process, and I'm not going to, but somebody else did, then what you find is that for, for some regimes, for small voltage, let's not get into all these nuances, but for some re regimes, and what you find is that the current that the tip sees and the current depends on um, on the position of the tip and the energy of the electrons, and and you can set the energy with the voltage E V equals E. So we can tune the volt, we can tune the energy of the electrons we're looking at, and the energy is set by this battery V. Then it turns out that we that the current that we measure is proportional. Let's Put a proportional sign here to this quantity uh, that we call the local density of states, and and it's a sum uh, over all the degenerate states um, and I can use a in quantum uh, just a generic quantum number k it's a sum over all the degenerate states um, and it's a sum over the wave function. The psi star psi of all the degenerate states that are at the energy that we're looking at. And this is a quantity that we call the local density of states, LDOS. 
And so this is an important point. This is like the starting point. And, it, and this is, it kind of makes sense because it's sort of like, you know, if, I, if I'm looking at some, you know, if this is the, the thing I'm looking at, you know, if this is like a potential and this is like some, some distance X, then my STM tip is sitting here. That's my tip. And it's sucking out electrons. It's sucking out all the electrons at some energy. So it makes sense that you would have wave functions. There's one and there might be another one here. You know, if there's, if that's, if, if there's like say two electron, two states that have the same energy, if, you know, then the elect, then the tip is going to see them. And what the tip sees the tip sees the, this probability density, psi star psi. And so if there's, if there's two states that have the same energy that the tip is looking at, then the tip, what the tip sees will be psi one star psi one plus psi two star psi two. All, it sees all the, all the states at the same energy, the probability. So, I'm hoping that if you think about that, you can sort of justify that to yourself. The, the, I guess the main point is simply that, is that the, uh, the, the current that flows into the STM tip is proportional to psi star psi, the probability density. That, that's the important point. But, uh, but it's a little more complicated because it turns out there might be many states at that energy. So you have to sum them all up. And so then that's where you get the sum of all the degenerate states. Okay. And they're all degenerate such that, and that's what the delta means, delta E minus EK, that just ensures that they're all the same energy. Okay, so that's what the STM sees. And so, so when I say, what does the STM see, then, then for this situation, then really what I'm asking is, what is the local density of states for this situation? I have a two-dimensional world filled with electrons. I drop a single atom in the middle of it, and what does the electron, the STM see? Well, the STM sees the local density of states. So the question then becomes, what is the local density of states for this situation? And, to, and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna calculate the local density of states and we can do it very easily using phase shifts. And so then that's why this all uses the, the stuff that you just learned in class. That's why I think this is a nice example. So, <clears throat> so the question then becomes, what is the local density of states basically the probability density of all the degenerate states at a particular energy. Um, let's write it down. This is the thing we've got to figure out. Uh, for an atom in a 2D metal. Okay, because that's, that's the question I'm asking. So let's figure that out. Um, and so, <clears throat> so this is the situation. So, so here's the, here's the 2D metal, the surface. There's my atom. This is like looking at it from the side view. That's my atom. Uh, but, and so what we're gonna do, we're gonna first do, let's first do the free case. Because remember, we're going to do this in using partial waves. And remember, for partial waves, the phase shift is always the, the change in the wave function due to the potential relative to the free case. So for the partial waves, we always start with the free case. Then we add the potential. And we see how does it change the wave function compared to the, free, to the case of a free electron. So let's first do the case of a free electron. Now in class, we did it for three dimensions. Now let's, three, <laughs> now we're gonna do it for two. <laughs> let's just do a different dimensionality. So this is the two dimensional case. So, so this is the free case. There's nothing there, no atom I mean. So let's do the free case. And so let's ask ourselves, um, what is the LDOS um, for, Three electrons in 2D. Okay, and so we have to basically figure out their their wave function. So so basically, what we have to do is solve 
H psi equals E psi in 2D and then add up psi star psi for all the degenerate states at, 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 at a particular energy. So let's do that. And so let's solve um, um, yeah, H psi equals E psi. And so um, let's see. So um, what we're gonna do is, is let's start with our Hamiltonian. And can someone tell me what the Hamiltonian is? All right, this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> we actually have to do something. So uh, we always start with the Hamiltonian. What's the Hamiltonian in this case? Somebody tell me. Is it P squared over 2M? Just that's, to connect the energy? That's exactly right. P squared over 2M, that's right. Uh, and why not just add a potential, you know, in case there's a potential, right? But for a free case, the potential is gonna equal what? What's the potential? Zero. Zero. That's right. Good, that's it. So you're right, it's just P squared over two M. You're totally right. Um, and uh, what, what coordinate system should we use? Somebody tell me. Cartesian. Well, that is certainly an option and that would make a lot of the math very easy because then the solution is just a plane wave, right? A two dimensional plane wave, but Keep in mind the problem that we want to solve eventually, which is what happens when I put a single atom point into the middle of this two-dimensional surface? What is the symmetry of the atom? Oh, polar coordinates. Right, because the atom has circular symmetry in two dimensions, right? So keeping that in mind, we want to do everything in polar coordinates. That's exactly right. That's the same reason why in three dimensions we do everything in spherical coordinates. Even though the math is harder, the reason is because the potential has that symmetry and we have to stick with the symmetry of the potential or else everything becomes intractable in the end. Uh, okay, so uh, good. So then let's, do, let's solve this problem in polar coordinates. And so that means that H <coughs> is equal to uh, negative H bar squared over 2M del squared, right? That's that's p squared. That's uh, p squared over two m, using the language of quantum mechanics. And so then we got to do del squared in polar. So what you do now is you go look in a book, right? You look at the front cover, the back cover, or something to find it. And when you do that, then we find that uh, I'll write, I'll tell you the answer. You guys could all look it up pretty easily. You've all seen it somewhere. It's negative h bar squared over two m. Uh, now we got to write del squared in polar coordinates. Uh, one over rho, d, d, rho, um, rho, oh my god, d, rho, plus one over rho squared, uh, d squared, d phi squared. Uh, that's the Hamiltonian. Um, and so then, uh, what I can do is, uh, I think I'm going to try to save myself a little bit of writing here, and I'm just going to say um, uh, h psi here, I'll put a psi here, right, rho phi is equal to e psi rho phi. And so what we've done is we're using, so here's our world, our 2D world. And we're using polar coordinates. Uh, can I draw them? So this is a uh, row, and this is phi, right? So just to remind you, so the the, the polar coordinates in in two D, in our in our two D world. Okay, so that's nice. And so now we have to solve. Okay, so that's a free particle in 2D, right? Free particle of mass M, the mass of the electron in 2D. That's what we've written 
And so let's solve it. So to solve it, we say that psi of rho phi equals what? How do we solve it? Somebody tell me. What's the trick? Separation of variables. Exactly. We always do separation of variables if possible. Sometimes it's not possible, but often it is if we have the right symmetry. Okay, good. So in separation of variables, we're gonna have a, a, a radial component and we're gonna have an angular component, right? Multiply the product, separation of variables. So then we so then we plug it in just like usual. Plug it in, just like you've done in the uh, a million times before. Well, I mean, actually, you've done it like four or five times before, but that felt like a million. Uh, and so you plug it in and you do the trick. You do the separation of variables trick, which I'm not going to get into, but you guys have done it a bunch of times. You must vaguely remember it. And so when you do the separation of variables trick, then what you find is that the angular part is easy. In 2D, it's very easy. I'm not going to go through the math, but it's easy. And it's, it, you, you find that y of phi is equal to uh, e to the plus or minus i l phi, where l is equal to an integer. And what do you think l is? Tell me, what is l? What is the physical interpretation of l? Is it the angular momentum? Yeah. Angular momentum is equal to h bar l. Right. And, you know, it's just the same reasoning as in 3D. I'm not going to go through all the details. You've gone through them before in 3D, and I'm just, you just trust me that in 2D, you get the same answer when you, it's, the math is actually easier in 2D. And then we, uh, now that, now we got to do the radial part. And from separation of variables, you get the radial part. And so there's a radial Schrodinger equation, just like in 3D. And the radial part looks like this. Rho squared, D squared, D rho squared, R of rho plus rho, D, D rho, R of rho plus 2me over h bar squared, rho squared minus l squared, bar of rho equals zero. Okay, this is just one way of writing it. And uh, if you put a negative sign in there, you know, it's just, I just arranged it in this particular way. Um, I will just mention that that's the centripetal, that's the centripetal um, potential although it might look a little funny just because I've multiplied variables in a funny way, but, but that's what it boils down to. So that is the radial Schrodinger equation. I just have chosen to write it this way. And the reason I chose to write it this way is because this is, this is a very famous equation when you write it this way. It's a very famous equation. Does anybody know what equation? It has a name. Does anybody know the name of it? Anybody? Anybody know the name of that equation? It's the equation that you get when you uh, have a drum and you go boink, boink and hit a drum, like with a drumstick, you know, bunk, 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 bunk. And you get drum modes, uh, the modes of a drum, like a, like a physical drum, you know, a drum head. The, you know, the, the modes of a drum head uh, are determined by this equation. This equation gives you the modes of a drum head should be called the drumhead equation, but it's not. Uh, and it's the equation that you get when you take a class in partial differential equations, where you, you, know, you solve partial differential equations on diff with different boundary conditions. I'm telling you, man, that's a useful class to take. You should all take it. That was one of my favorite classes partial, as an undergrad, partial differential equations, quite useful for physics. If you had taken that, <laughs> that class, you know the name of this equation. Has anyone out there Take in partial differential equation. One of you guys did. I know it. Come on. Does it look? Does it look familiar? Just, just say yes if it looks familiar. Uh, you guys are there, right? I mean, my internet connection hasn't broken. Are you guys out there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I guess not many of you have taken that class. That's okay. 
times change. Uh, so um, it's not I, cymatics, is it? Say it again. Cymatics, or is that I'm thinking of something else? Oh no, no. I I mean maybe maybe that's another name for it. I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with that name. I mean maybe it is, but the name that I'm familiar with is uh, Bessel's equation. Bessel, Bessel, Mr. Bessel or Mrs. Bessel. I don't know. I don't know Bessel's gender, but it's the best. It's is this called the Bessel the Bessel's equation? And so as a result, the solution are what? What do you think is the solution? It's Bessel's equation. So what do you think the solution is? Bessel functions. Exactly. It's the Bessel functions. And so the solutions, and this is not something that you solve. You just look it up in a book, right? No one like goes through all the tedious details. I mean, Bessel did it, solved it, but no one, no one after Bessel ever solved it. Uh, you just look up the solutions. Uh, and so the solutions are, um, this is the solution. The solutions, of course, are the Bessel functions. And now we don't even do that. We don't even do that silly spherical stuff. They're just Bessel functions. Because Bessel's equation was originally done in two dimensions. It was done to, to solve drum head motion waves and a, two -dim and a drum head. And so this is the natural coordinate system for it. Uh, so that, that's the solution. It's a Bessel function. So function, but that's not the only solution. It turns out that there's another solution, and you know what it is. What is it? It's the same as in 3D. The Neumann function. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly right. The Neumann function, exactly. But now it's not the spherical Neumann function. It's just the Neumann function. So we get these two solutions, uh, and so of course we, you know, we'll call one A and the other B. So that's the solution. And this is this. And so, uh, you know, this is a solution with a well defined energy and angular momentum. Because once again, you know, K is always going to be 2ME over H bar squared. Um, and so, um, uh, but then <clears throat> for the free particle, we know that rho equals zero is included. And we also know that the Neumann function, when we take the limit to zero, is equal to what? It always is equal to this. What is it? You know it. Infinity. Say it again, what? Infinity. That's right. And therefore, B is equal to what? Just the Bessel function. No, no, this is oh, yeah. yeah, zero, right. And so then exactly, that's what you just said. And so we then see that the radial uh, functions, the radial wave functions are the Bessel functions. And this should look very familiar to you because it's the same thing we got in 3D. In, in 3D, we had the spherical Bessel functions in 2D, it's just the Bessel functions. So it's the same, you know, it should look very familiar to you. And so that means then, that the um, <clears throat> that means then that the eigenstates once are now when we plug everything back in. Remember the eigenstates are going to be the radial part times the angular part, and now we know what they all are. It's going to be um, some normalization factor times the uh, Bessel function times the uh, um, angular part. Uh, and so here we know that uh, E is equal to H bar squared K squared over 2M and uh, L is equal to an integer. It's just the, ang the angular momentum. Okay, so those are the eigenstates that, and they should look very familiar to you. It's just instead of the spherical harmonic, we just have the E to the I of, uh, L phi. Um, and so now what we can do then is and so if we're taking a picture of these eigenstates with our, S, with our STM, here's the tip. <clears throat> and so here's the electrons living in this 2D world. And we want to take a picture. And the picture that we get, we can take a picture of the local density of states. And when I say we take a picture, what I mean is <clears throat> we move the STM tip in space. And at every position, we measure the current. 
And that's how we take a picture because the, the picture, what we're doing is we're taking a picture of the, of the electrical current at different locations in space and at a fixed energy. And the energy is fixed by the battery, right? The battery is, um, the energy is fixed by the battery. Uh, and so that's the picture, but this picture, but this is a, but this is a picture of the local density of states. So when we take a picture with the STM, we're taking a picture of this quantity, the local density of states. And so what do we see? Well, now we're in a position to, uh, to, uh, to tell, to answer that question, because the local density of states as a function of position and energy uh, is equal to um, the sum over all possible degenerate states. And so what, what is the quantum number here that we sum over? To list all of our degenerate free states, all the states that are degenerate one energy, what do we sum over? Because we want to sum over all the, all the psi star psi for all the degenerate states because the STM is looking at all the states of a particular energy. So we need to know how many, we need to know what they all are and, and sum them all up because that's what we see. So what, what am I summing over? Somebody tell me, guess. K. Okay, K is a good one, is a good guess. K is, but, but look here, K is energy, right? And the energy is fixed by the battery. And so energy is fixed. We're, we're doing the experiment at one energy. So I don't sum over K. That's the wrong quantum number. I, I mean, I know in my previous form, I just used K, but that was just like a, some generic like momentum. But I don't sum over K here because K is fixed. And K is not a vector in, in, in spherical coordinates. You know, it's just the energy. So that was a good guess, but that's not right. We're not summing over K. What do we sum over? L. Yes, exactly. We sum over L. Because as you can see here from, from the eigenstate, for one particular energy, how many different possible Ls can I have? Somebody tell me. This is the structure of the eigenstate. I've written it here. Here's a formula for it. And I'm asking you for a given energy, how many different possible L's are there that all have that same energy? Eigenstates of different L that all have the same energy. How many are there? Tell me. Infinite. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's exactly correct. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna sum over all of them, L equals zero to infinity. And what we're gonna sum over is psi star psi. And so what do you get? So take this thing and do psi star psi, what do we get? First, I'll ask you, what happens to this part, e to the i l phi? If I do psi star psi, what happens to that part? Goes away, it's just yes. one. Turns into one. And so what are we left with? The we magnitude left? of the Bessel function? Squared. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, sorry. Exactly, it's exactly right. So, and let's not worry about that normalization factor. <clears throat> and so we have uh, J L of K rho squared. So that's it, that's what we see, that's it. You see, that, that's the answer, you know? That's it, that's the local density of states. We actually worked it out. So that's kind of cool, that's the local density of states. That's literally what you measure experimentally with an STM if you look at a two-dimensional uh, surface filled with electrons at one particular energy. That's what you would see. And what is this? So if we take, if we take this quantity, these Bessel functions and sum them all up like this, like in this little formula, the question is, what the hell is that? Um, and I'll call this the free, you know, this is the free local density of states for the free particle. 
Um, and I don't actually expect you to know this, but if you, it turns out that there's all these identities and you know that, it, it, there's all these identities that you find in various math books. And it turns out that there's one of them for summing up decimal functions. And so if you take all the decimal functions from L equals zero to infinity and sum them all up, then you get, you get something. Do you guys know what you get, what that's equal to? Does anybody, can you guess? It's gonna be something with pi in it. I bet that much. <laughs> Perfect, that's exactly the right answer. That's what you should say. Pi, you say it's either one or zero or pi or E, E. So, <laughs> so that's exactly right. It's some constant. I, I can't even remember, maybe it's pi, I forget. You know, it's in a book somewhere, but it's C, it's a constant. And that's something that you just see in a book, okay? It's in a book, some book. Okay, it's just one of those things, you know, it's in a book, it's a constant. I forget what it is, probably pi. Um, so now, okay, that's great. So, so that's the free particle. So now let's put the atom in. Now we're ready to put in the impurity, the atom. And so what does the atom do? Um, and so let's look at the atom. I mean, so here's the, here's the atom sitting on the surface. And we'll put him, of course, at rho equals zero. And, and so this is the potential. And so the atom is going to create some kind of cylindrical potential. Right? And this is rho. And there's going to be, <clears throat> and that's the, that's the potential of the atom, potential of atom. And then there's going to be the centripetal potential, which is, comes from, you know, where did it come from? It, it, this term right here. That's the, that, it, when you work it all out, that's the centripetal potential. And it, it, has, it does the same thing that it does in 3D. I have the L equals one, the L equals two, the L equals three. And for L equals zero, the, the potential is gone. There is no potential for L equals zero. Let's just, I'm getting kind of confused here. My rows and my Ls, I realize, look very similar. L equals zero. The potential, this is the, the centripetal potential. And so, Let's just confine ourselves to low energy. And so what we want to know is what happens? Basically, my question is, my question that we're trying to figure out is how does the atom change the local density of states? Because we we realize that the STM images the local density of states. We realize that if there's no atom there, the local density of states is just flat and constant. Now we put the atom there, and now the question I'm asking is, how does that change the local density of states? And of course, phase shifts are going to play a role in answering this question. Uh, and so that's what, because that's what we see with the STM is local density of states. So if I put the atom there, how is that going to change the local density of states? And you know that the local density states is made up of all the wave functions squared up. And so, the, and so that, to answer that question, we have to ask, how do the wave functions change due to the atom? And the atom is really tiny. And let's suppose that the energy of the electrons is really low, okay? So let's consider, and, and we see that in the local density states, we have all the different angular momentum components are in there. And so, um, <clears throat> Now I'm going to ask you a question. If the energy of my electrons are low, which, which means I have my battery is a very small battery voltage, because that's set to the energy, right? E equals E times V, the local voltage of the battery. Um, then in order to see the atom, in order to see the atom, I need my angular momentum of my electron to be I'm asking you, big or little? Small. Yes. How small? 
close to zero, less than one. Let's suppose that K times R naught, which is the size of the atom, radius of atom, is tiny, okay? And if K R naught is tiny, that means that the maximum L is tiny. And so the phase shift only matters, delta L only matters for L equals what? Tell me. Zero. That's right. Only the zero, the, the, only, the only angular momentum component that reaches the atom is the L equals zero component. So that's the only partial wave that gets phase shifted. All the other ones don't make it because like if I have, for example, L equals two, that wave function goes D, 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 and then it, it stops, it, it hits that centripetal barrier and then it falls and it dies before it hits the atom. That would be for, for example, L equals two. And so they all die. None of them make it, none of those partial waves make it to the atom, only L equals zero. <clears throat> so, so the atom, so if I have L greater than zero, then I'm asking you a question. What is the wave function of an electron in the presence of the atom? What is the radial wave function of, a, of an electron in two dimensions in the presence of an atom for L greater than zero? Somebody tell me. <clears throat> Just the Bessel function? Exactly. But how about for L equals zero? It's um, phase shifted by delta zero. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But that's for, but, but you do remember that's for large rho far away from the atom, okay? Because right next, right at the atom, it gets a little complicated, okay? <clears throat> there might be some funky stuff going on because the potential has, you know, all the details, but we're not worrying about those details because whatever they are, they're just gonna shift the phase far away. You see that? That's the beauty of the phase shift concept. That's why we like it so much, is all the complexity gets just buried in that one simple parameter, the phase shift. You see that? So, so this is, so that's right. So what that means then is that if I'm looking far from the atom, <clears throat> then, <clears throat> then my local density of states <clears throat> is going to be this. So this is my local density of states, LDOS at, at some energy. It's a function of rho and energy. We know it's going to be equal to the sum from L equals zero to infinity of um, my uh, radial wave function squared, right? Um, and so we know that for L equals one to infinity, my radial wave function is what? <clears throat> Just the Bessel function? Phase shifted, yes or no? Not phase shifted. Exactly. But for L equals zero, this, this part is different, right? What, what is my L equals zero part? What is what does the L equals zero component of the local density of states look like? What is that? Is it the magnitude of the wave shifted Bessel function? Exactly. Exactly. It's going to be J L of K rho plus delta naught. You see, that's my that's my L dos. That's that's what we see. That's what the STM will see. At least that's what we're predicting it will see. We're theorists right now. You see that? That is the LDOS. So we calculated it. That's kind of cool. 
We don't know what that phase shift is, but we know there will be a phase shift and whatever it is, it's gonna determine what we see with the STM. So now let's take a closer look at this function and let's, let's work through a few little details. Let's play a little game. <clears throat> let's do a little math trick. Let's add zero. Zero is equal to J naught of K rho um, squared minus uh, J naught of K rho squared. Okay, this is the L equals zero Bessel function. So let's take the L equals zero Bessel function. Oh well, yeah, let's see, I should do this. This one is the L equals zero one right here, zero. So let's add zero to this term. And so when I add zero, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this guy and I'm gonna go plus J naught K rho squared. And for this guy, I'm gonna go minus J naught of K rho squared. Now, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Well, the reason I did it is because now this part is equal to what? That constant. Yes, that's why I did it, exactly. So now we see that L dos of rho E is equal to um, J naught of K rho plus delta naught squared minus J naught of K rho squared plus a constant. So all that, all that complexity got swallowed up in just a simple constant. And now to make things even more simple, let's look, let's look, let's do the large R expansion. At large rho, let's remember that J sub L of K rho is equal to, what is it? I have a formula for it somewhere. <clears throat> Where is it for large rho? Well, uh, I don't have the general formula for all the Bessel functions, but I know the formula for J zero. So J naught of K rho for large R is equal to, it's just simply square root of two over uh, pi K rho times cosine of K rho minus pi over four. All right, and that, and that's a, that should look kind of familiar because that's just this very famous kind of behavior. It just looks like this, right? That's the J naught as a function of rho. All right, so I'm just plugging it in. It's just the dying cosine, sort of the famous Bessel function. And so now we see then that the, uh, we're predicting then that the local density of states that we see in the vicinity of the atom is gonna now we can write it as this very simple thing. I got that constant plus I got this this part, the, the prefactor, which is gonna be two over uh, pi k rho. And now I have these cosines and I have uh, you know this is my formula. So I so I basically I see I have a phase shifted cosine. minus a not a non-phase shifted cosine. See that? So I just I just write it out, these little formulas, and it's cosine squared k rho uh, minus pi over four uh, plus delta naught minus cosine squared k rho minus pi over four. All right, and that's what we predict that we see. So that's what it looks like, okay? So that's what we expect to see on the surface. That's the atom, and so we expect to see this sort of funky dying cosine function thing. All right, so this is a prediction. So now, 
Now what do we do? Okay, we've made a prediction. What do we do next? We're physicists, we're scientists. What do we do? Folks, what do we do? We've made a prediction. What do we do after the prediction is done? Now it's time to do what? What? Test it. test it. That's right. We test it. That's exactly right. So now we test the prediction. And the way we test it is by putting an atom on a surface. And so the surface that we're going to do is copper. And it's a crystal. It's called the 111 surface of copper. And we're going to put an atom on top. And the atom we're going to put on is iron. Okay. And then we're going to look at it with an STM. That's the tip. So we're going to, that's what we're going to do. So let's do that experiment. So it turns out that I actually did that experiment many years ago. And so here I'll show you the results. Let's uh, stop the sharing. Uh, how am I going to do this? Stop the sharing. Now let's go to the share screen. Um, let's see. Can you guys all see my screen? <clears throat> Can you see my screen, folks? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. I emailed myself this thing. God damn it. Where did it go? Okay. Yeah. There it is. I forgot to put it onto this computer. Paper. I'm sorry. There it is. Uh, sorry. I got to get this thing onto my desktop. Okay, good. So here's the paper. Okay, so this is a paper that I published 27 years ago. All right. Confinement of electrons to quantum corals on a metal surface. So 20, <laughs> 27 years ago. That's me when I was a postdoc. And so this is the thing. Can you guys all see this? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so here it is. So uh, this, this picture, can you see my cursor move? Yes. Okay, so this is, this, is a, this is what you see when you put a single iron atom at the surface of copper and take a picture of it with an STM. You have to have a really, really good STM <laughs> to do this, but we, at, we, we turns out we did at that time. And so, and so this spike is the center, that's the atom is, is in that spike. But with the STM, what we're seeing is the electrons all around it. And so you see these rings. This is what we saw. And so now, if you take a slice, a cross section, then you, this is what you see, this, the dark uh, line, right? Um, um, and so now let's do something else. Um, This is, let's see, I think I have something else here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, my God. I hate PowerPoint being such a pain. Okay, you guys see this? Can, can you see this okay, folks? Yes. Okay, do you, so you see this little equation right here? Yes. Okay, cosine squared k rho minus pi over four plus delta naught minus cosine squared k rho minus pi over four over k rho, yeah, you see it? Yep. Okay, that's the little formula that we, we just derived in class. And so here, you see this solid line? Can you see my cursor, you see that? That's the data, right? See, it says height, distance, you see that? Yes. Okay, so that's, that data is, is basically measuring the current from the little STM tip as we move it across the surface. Now, we cannot notice that if we get really close to zero, which is the location of the atom, it goes haywire, right? Because, you know, all this weird stuff is happening there. But if we go far from the atom, out here, see the 20, that's 20 angstroms away. Now remember, the size of an atom is one angstrom. So that means we're like 20 radiuses away. So that's far. 
and no and now now you see that see that dash curve can you see the dash curve guys yes yes okay that dash curve is this formula that we just derived in class okay so i want you to see that the formula works pretty good for for experimentalists we call this a good fit okay so you see that the formula is matching the experiment and so the conclusion is that <clears throat> um, quantum mechanics works <laughs> yay <laughs> and so this was for a fit for a part so basically what we're able to do from this from this measurement is the the only unknown parameter so this is a fit i'm using this formula to fit the data can you can someone tell me what the main fitting parameter is what do you think is it rho well, rho is the function, you know, it's, it's a function of rho, but I'm asking what's the fitting parameter? Is it the delta? Yes, the phase shift, because basically everything else we know, except for the phase shift. And so the phase shift is the fitting parameter. And so by varying the fitting parameter, we get this fit. So this fit is for one particular phase shift. And I can't remember what it was. It was like 60 degrees or something, you know, it was some number. You know, I forget, you know, pi over three or something, you know, we, we, I did the fit 27 years ago and, you know, I can't remember what it is exactly, but it was like, you know, 60 degrees or something like that. And so that's the phase shift. And so for, so the point is that this scattering of the iron atom can be characterized, you know, all the, com all the, comp you know, this is like a pretty complicated system. I mean, it got atoms and copper and it's a crystal and blah, 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 all these details, but all those details sort of don't matter in the end. It's just very simple quantum mechanics. It's just free particles and scattering and a phase shift. And that, and that explains everything. So that's the beauty of it, okay? So I want you to see that the simple physics that you learn in the class actually can be used to describe very complex uh, systems. And so here, if you take a bunch of these, um, if you take a bunch of these iron atoms and you put them into a ring, then you get this. This is called a quantum corral. Have you guys seen that before? Has anyone of the, has any of you guys seen that before? I haven't seen a picture, but I've heard the word. It always makes me laugh because like corral, I think of like the old west and like cows. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really funny because when we did this, me and these other two guys who did it, we were sitting around, we we're thinking, oh, this thing looks so cool. This looks so fucking cool. You know, we got to come up with a cool name. And so we were like, what should we call it? And, you know, I was looking, I was like, hey, it's got those things, the atoms look kind of like, like posts of a fence, you know? And so it's like a corral. And, you know, because it's like corralling the electrons. So then we came up with the quantum corral. <laughs> but we, we sat around specifically trying to come up with a cool name. And that's what we came up. That's what we came up with. Okay, so, but this is different because now you see that now this is different from the physics that we were describing in class because now the electrons are confined by this circular boundary. So now the physics of this quantum crawl is actually particle in a box physics. It's not the scattering, like each individual atom is doing the phase shift thing, but collectively it's sort of like a, a, um, a confining potential. So like a, like a box. So that's not the physics I really wanna talk about today. Today I wanted to talk about the physics of uh, the single atom. You know the local density states of a single atom the isolated atom where you get these rings and these rings that you see are perfectly explained by the by this uh, scattering phase shift concepts that we've been discussing in class okay uh that's all that i want to say about uh scattering so now we're kind of done with scattering so do you guys have any last questions on scattering yeah, I'm just curious, when we do the, with the atom in the center, um, so that there's something at zero, uh, why can we still ignore the Neumann functions uh, for the confined particle? Um, why do we still, no, it, it, you, you can do it with the Neumann functions. I mean, uh, you know, I just sort of, because here's the thing is that, um, the Neumann functions are there. I'll, sh I'll show you here. Let's let's I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, let me let me see. Let me get this. 
So it's going to be like this. Um, let me. Uh, let me get this sharing going again. Okay, because if we can you see it now? Can you see my? Can you see the? You can see the iPad thing, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so for L equals zero, then we determine that the radial wave function is equal to um, J L of K rho plus delta naught, right? Uh, oh, 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 yeah. So this is L equals zero. Okay. And so for L equals zero, then we notice then that this thing is equal to, um, uh, it has a limit. It goes to uh, one over K rho cosine K rho minus pi over four plus delta naught. Right? And so then what happens is that, re remember this, this thing is gonna be, you'll note it, you'll remember then that the cosine of K rho minus pi over four plus delta naught is gonna be equal to, um, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be um, sine, remember that formula de delta naught times Cos, I forget, you know, uh, I forget, you know, the exact trig identity, but it's going to be sine delta naught times cosine of k rho minus pi over four plus cosine delta naught of sine k rho minus pi over four. Uh, you, you know, one over this. This is going to be the uh, r e zero of rho. And, and so this is gonna be my JL of K rho, and this is gonna be my NL of K rho. I guess what I'm trying to say is the phase shifted Bessel function is equal to a Bessel function plus a Neumann function. You know, it's, it's this whole, so the, I'm just trying to say the Neumann function is in there. It's all part of this thing. It's like, remember sine of, x plus delta is equal to um you know something times sine x plus something times cosine x and so by phase shifting the vessel function that that is that is the neumann part uh, did, does that answer your question at all oh that makes so much sense thank you yeah okay. now i okay. get it thank you okay so so it is in there i it's just the math i did i i sort of I just did some tricky math avoiding the Neumann function, but it's it is there. Um, okay, folks. So, okay, any any other last questions on this? Okay, so we just have another minute or two. <clears throat> I will just mention the next topic, but I, I don't have time. You know, I'm not going to get into it because I won't I won't go over. But I will just mention that the next topic uh, is WKB. Okay, and WKB is a uh, new approximation technique. And the whole point of WKB, it's an approximation, the WKB approximation. And the whole point is to solve the Schrodinger equation, like usual. So the WKB approximation is a new way to solve the Schrodinger equation. It's an, a new approximation technique. And I just want to say that so far we've done, we've learned two approximation techniques in this class. The first one was perturbation theory. And the whole point of perturbation theory is to solve, you might have forgotten, but the whole point is to solve the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> That's why we did it. Uh, and the other one that we learned was the uh, variational principle. And that also was to solve the Schrodinger equation, but but the variational principle was really just for finding the ground state, which 
is actually pretty useful, more useful than you might expect. And so now what we're going to learn is a third technique called WKB. And WKB is also for solving the Schrodinger equation. And they each have their own regime of validity. Like for example, for perturbation theory, that was really useful when we have a known function, a known Hamiltonian plus a small perturbation where H prime is much less than H naught. That was perturbation theory. The variational principle was just for the ground state. There was no uh, constraints on the variational principle. It always works. It just gives uh, uh, upper limit. You, you always can find the upper limit on the ground state energy. And it always works for finding the upper limit. Uh, and WKB is useful when you have some complicated potential and you're looking at energies that are uh, is lar that are large. You're looking at, at, at large energies. You're looking at the high energy solution to some potential where energy, where the energy tends to be a lot bigger than the potential. So when you're looking at very high energy solutions, then WKB can be, can be quite useful. Well, maybe this is not exactly the regime of validity, but it's, we, we will talk about those details next time. But that's, that is the next topic. That's, that's what we're gonna do next time. So uh, that's it, bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.